Night is defense, Monsters defense, uh, entitled Localization Facts and Trading Card Games, Magic the Gathering for English and for Portuguese. And uh, you have uh, 20 minutes to present, right? Afterwards, I would invite the members of the examining board to sit at the table and then start the, you know, the grilling. It's <laughs> the most interesting part, right? So, um, thank you very much again for coming. So, um, later I will introduce the members of the examining board, okay? Later. Maybe the floor is yours. Thank you, Lincoln. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, as Lincoln said, my, uh, this is my master's research entitled Localization Practices and Trading Card Games, Magic the Gathering from English into Portuguese. So we will begin by uh, giving you a brief idea of how the introduction was with the context of investigation, the objective and principles, and also my research questions. As to the context of investigation, um, we have a very important text by Lambert and Van Gogh that defines translated products as being either linguistically adequate, that is a resulting product that is understandable in the target language, but not much more than that, or culturally acceptable, that is adapted in order to look like it could work created specifically for that target audience. In the case of trading card games, the translation uh, must reflect the game rules so they can be followed during play without the need to consult a textbook or a judge. In this type of translation service, there may be some uh, policies that uh, may be in effect during this type of service, there would be departments such as marketing, research and development, copyright design, and even legal departments. Therefore, the objective of my research is to analyze the English to Portuguese localization of the Magic 2013 core set by studying the constraints that determine the localization practices and the policies which may influence this type of uh, translation service. I have two main guiding principles directing this research. One of them related to font sizes, that they are expected to be usually reduced in the Portuguese cards because we need more words in Portuguese to convey the same message. And another principle related to style, it is expected that the cards are translated with um, stylistic direction to the source system um, with linguistic and cultural terms from the source system, but following uh, Brazilian Portuguese only in relation to the language, therefore creating a linguistically adequate translation product. My research questions that uh, have guided this research are what are some of the main technical constraints involved in the localization of this product from English into Portuguese? What localization decisions could affect the final localized product and how? And what localization policies can affect translation decisions? Now I will move on to the review of literature where I will briefly um, describe texts that have been uh, published in relation to localization, localization of games, and then trading card games more specifically. Localization being uh, the linguistic, cultural, and technical adaptation of a given product into a specific market as defined by Palumbo. The literature on localization is more directed to software developers and not much to translators. That literature tends to value pre-localization development, uh, namely internationalization, a lot more than the translational task at hand. Uh, the translation task only gains uh, focus and prominence in essential translation studies textbooks, such as Mondays and Palumbo's. And uh, then they describe the translation text that localization involves and all comprises instead of giving a textbook on how localization should fit the industry. As to localization of games, there are several um, several studies, and here I'm highlighting only three. Um, first, Donovan's that uh, reinforces the idea that many other uh, papers published uh, value that would be preferring uh, certain best practices based on the experience in developing games. Again, for developers, and not for translators. They prefer game style instead of grammar, and they also prefer 
to hire better test beamers to localize products instead of uh, professional translators. Their argument to do that is that uh, the better test gamers have greater immersion in the game context, situation, and flavor. Then we have two other very important concepts in the localization of games. That uh, one of them is culturalization by Kate Edwards, being uh, the localization that's going to give the player a more meaningful and engaging experience without offensive content or uh, estrangement. Uh, we also have the concept of transcreation by Mangoran and O'Hagan that is in tune, uh, valuing the fact that localization could uh, have creative liberties in order to produce an intuitive feeling of having the game produced for that audience without any oddities to truncate or disturb the experience. As to localization of trading card games, there has, um, there has been some academic research but none of them related to linguistics or translation. So that's where I come in. Moving on to the method where I will briefly describe the analysis model as well as the research object and uh, the analytical procedures that I have used. The analysis model is uh, the one you can see on the table. This is my adaptation to the literary translation analysis model by Lambert and Van Hoor to uh, trading card games as a textual genre. I have uh, chosen and adapted this model in order to observe if the localization is uh, oriented predominantly towards the target system, being culturally acceptable, or to the source system, being linguistically adequate. Research object being Magic the Gathering. This is the first and biggest trading card game to have ever been produced so far. It's an American game, started in 1993. And um, in relation to game theory, one thing that is very interesting about magic is that it carries what has been defined by a shell, the element of surprise. And the card rules, uh, these rules may surprise um, a person's opponent, but also the player, him or herself, in each and every move in a match. In relation to its localization, um, we have a very rough approximation of 1,500 cards being released every year nowadays. Uh, and this release is simultaneous in all countries. And it is localized to uh, these 10 languages, which include Brazilian Portuguese. As you may know, it's the only uh, language that explicitates the locale as being Brazil. The others don't. Um, my analytical procedures involved um, defining this um, Four set of cards that total 249 cards in each language. And I have gathered the actual spoiler of the cards that are available in the official game database. And I have performed manual alignment using Nota Plus Plus and later used Wordsmith 3.0 to perform uh, queries in relation to keywords and concordance. And with that data, I have cross-reference the data with the Lambert and Van Gogh adapted model in order to find macrostructural, microstructural, and systemic context details, and I will explain this shortly. Um, for this presentation, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to present the data, as well as the results and discussion and how we're going to connect to the research questions and guiding principles. Starting to, uh, by describing uh, my corpus, my corpus is from um, um, American English and Brazilian Portuguese. Um, that makes it a unidirectional corpus, and it is also a synchronic corpus. The Magic 2013 core set is one fixed point in the game development history, having future and previous editions. And also it is of specialized domain that is the trading card games genre released in June 2012. Um, the typicality is of a games, games company being the um, company Wizards of the Coast, the owner of the game. And uh, the mode and medium of the corpus would be the textual extraction of the digitalized version of the cards that are printed to be played. Okay. My overall corpus size is of 51,945 words. Um, first data that I can show you is that the average words per card has different numbers in English and Portuguese. You have 35 
uh, words in English and 40 words in Portuguese. Um, this can also be um, observed in the rule book of the game, that is my meta text here, that shows, as you can see on the table, a higher type token ratio. This, um, these two facts prove that there is higher lexical density in Brazilian Portuguese, and also it is possible for me to imply that this is due to the repetition of keyword abilities and also game rules throughout both cards of rulebook. Starting with uh, Lambert and Van Gorth analysis, we are going to start with the pre preliminary data with uh, present of genre authors and localizators. In the booster packs and the two figures in both languages, you have uh, explicitation that the product is a translation because it says Portuguese on the package. And also, there is explicitation of the genre only in the Brazilian version. They say Kings Estampas Ilustradas, and in Portuguese, the name is called Jogos Estampas Ilustradas. And whereas in the uh, development language version, there is no such information. On the Rupal credits, um, there is explicit crediting to two translators that are Brazilian and two localizators that are not Brazilian and are employed by Wizards of the Coast, so they are in-house localizators. It's possible to assume that they are more like project managers than actually translating the product. On the meta text, that is the basic rule book, uh, by collecting the most frequent words, only one verb has been found, which is rather interesting. And uh, by checking the collocational horizon between uh, one word to the left and one word to the right for uh, the verb can in both languages. In the full uh, pieces, I have analyzed each of these occurrences closely, but um, under the model of uh, translational correspondences by Martha Thunes, most of these occurrences are type two. Type two means that they are nearly literal translation, with very few changes in relation to word order or syntactically restricted grammatical words. So this reflects that the text has a very strong normative character. In relation to the macrostructure analysis, we need to uh, stop for a moment and focus on the text division. Here you see a picture with a, a card and it's different areas where you have text. So you have three basic sections that I have divided non-translated sections being the ones in white and those of importance, the ones circled in red, that I have called game text. This is where you have the type line, rules text, and reminder text that are um, textual elements that are very algorithmical for you to follow the algorithm during play. And from the observation of the corpus, they have the linguistically adequate translation that I have mentioned. However, there's these two sections that I have marked in blue are sections that I have called creative text. This is the card name and the flavor text. And this text has no effect in gameplay. They aid in understanding the story of behind it. So although the game is translated in these sections also with the linguistically adequate um, framework, let's say, this is a place where there is room for transcreation. Okay. Uh, coming closer to the microstructure analysis, let's take a moment to look at the lexical choices. As you can see on the tables, the words for some uh, card names are rather uncommon. Um, this is one of the um, policies that I have observed from the corpus. There is a prerogative already in the development language of research and development of using sophisticated vocabulary. There's an article by the head designer explicitating this. And uh, this could be part of the translation policies that the uh, localization team also has to follow. These uh, uncommon word choices reinforce the element of fantasy and exoticism since the game doesn't involve the real world in relation to some grammatical patterns, we have on the table some keyword abilities. These are one-word summaries of a larger expla explanation of a rule that has to be enacted in play. And here I have used the three colors to separate them in three categories. That the game also divides them in these categories. The one in black that's exalted is a triggered ability. It only functions depending on the occurrence of a specific effect in play. 
And this is translated as an adverb, and that makes sense because the um, creature becomes exalted as something happens. The ones that are um, highlighted in blue on the table, these are activated abilities. They require certain player actions to function. The um, triggered abilities doesn't requ don't require any player action. And these are translated as verbs because they are actions to be performed, like equipping and regenerating a creature. The ones in red, however, these are static abilities. If a card is in play, they are functioning. So these are, or should be, knows, translated as nouns because they are in it characteristics that may be gained or lost, but still in it characteristics. In relation to language levels, I'm going to focus for this presentation on game jargon, which is something that's very present in the game. You talk about the game as you play it. And on the figure, you have a very small example of the steps in every turn of the game, which shows a very algorithmical nature. And um, we talk about card elements, match elements, and also the game mechanic keywords that I've mentioned. This figure is also a very clear example um, that the use of translation memory systems um, can be implied because there is a lot of similarity between each segment on each line because it must follow the algorithm, so they have to be consistent. Now, putting these two layers of analysis together into the systemic context, both micro and macro analysis indicate that there is consistency in linguistically adequate translation for trading card games because of the normative character of the game. However, in the creative text that I have mentioned before, there is room for transcreation. One um, technical constraint that I can uh, very clearly show you in this picture, for example, is that there is font reduction in 41% of the cards in my corpus. Now, um, these are probably automatically adapted or performed by someone else, not the translators, but the translators could take this into consideration because some translation strategies could reduce the number of words so the cards would fit more comfortably in the small space of the medium. Um, moving on to the conclusion of my work, um, I have given you most of the findings in the uh, data analysis section, so now I'm going to focus only on limitations and suggestions for future research. Um, Limitations are mostly related to the corpus. The corpus is rather small because it has only 51,000 words, only one core set. Uh, however, although the cards are rather small, there is a lot of text in them, so this should be taken into consideration. Also, the corpus is only textual. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't upload the images to the corpus, but that would also be important um, because of technical constraints, we couldn't, but that will also be important due to this. For future research, I have two paths in relation to the corpus, in relation to voices. Okay? The corpus could be larger, having not only one core set, but the entire year expansions that would give me, that would give us, all of us, more room for uh, narrative studies and also make the corpus a little more representative. The corpus could also be dynamic, using cards from previous or future editions to talk about the translation uh, evolution. And the corpus could be multimodal. As I said, the images would make the text all, as authentic as possible, as Leach has uh, mentioned. And uh, they would be useful for multimodal studies about, for example, gender and ethnic representation in uh, the card illustrations. Finally, the corpus could be multilingual. The game is translated to 10 languages, so there could be lingu uh, language scholars of 10 languages um, making this corpus bigger, and we would be able to create an idea of best practices in relation to the localization of this type of game. In relation to voice, in this research we only have the researcher's voice, but we could add the translator's voice, perhaps through semi-structured interviews, um, to have a closer idea of translation process and also to confirm these observed practices and also the voice of players. Um, perhaps through analyzing blogs to 
uh, or recording matches or performing semi-structured interviews with players and judges for reception studies. Therefore, this is the end of my presentation, guys. Thank you very much for coming.